नमस्कार एंड वेलकम टू इंडियन डिप्लोमेसी शो ऑन इंडिया नेशनल टेलीविजन चैनल दूरदर्शन अबाउट इंडिया इंटरनेशनल रिलेशन टू हेल्प व्यूअर्स अंडरस्टैंड दि न्यूआंसिस एंड द इन डेप्थ नॉलेज गेन इन डेप्थ नॉलेज अबाउट इंडिया फॉरन रिलेशन इंडिया इन्वॉलमेंट इन शेपिंग दि इमर्जिंग वर्ल्ड ऑर्डर व्यूअर्स इन दिस एपिसोड वी आर टेकिंग अप द थीम ऑफ इंडिया ट्राइलैक्ट्रल पार्टनरशिप्स इंडिया प्लस टू अदर कंट्रीज jointly teaming up uh, for dialogue and for activities and projects on the ground to remake uh, different regions of the world and uh, also to advance their respective national interests and to discuss this uh, topic i have a very uh, distinguished guest with me in the studio let me introduce you to him uh, professor harsh vipant professor harsh pant is one of the leading scholars of international affairs uh, in india he is a professor at king's college london and vice president of studies and foreign policy at a top uh, think tank uh, observer research foundation harsh welcome to indian diplomacy hello hello shriram well good to be here harsh uh, when we talk of trilateral partnership trilateral cooperation it's obviously different from bilateral and it's not as big as multilateral as in broader uh, bigger groups so and it seems like india especially is engaging in more of these trilateral formats uh, lately so uh, why do you think this is happening and what uh, how do you see trilateral as a distinct category uh, if at all it can be termed so from the bilateral and the broader multilateral uh shiram this has this is an age where multilateral institutions are not working and everyone is disappointed and dejected almost by the state of disarray that we find in our multilateral frameworks uh, and trilateral uh, cooperation takes us beyond just a bilateral interaction between two states and allows us to frame our respective national interest respective uh, you know uh, functional cooperation in ways that perhaps would not be possible in a strictly bilateral format now mm. triangular cooperation which used to be the no- which has been the norm for quite some time where you will you will have uh, you know a, a relationship where two uh, where three countries would come together and uh, you know deliver aid or or, or work on uh, uh, infrastructure in 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 certain countries yeah. that had been the norm in in uh, if you especially in the developmental aid uh, areas but what in recently we have seen is a strategic cooperation mm. uh, has taken the th- uh, has taken the focus uh, as far as trilaterals are concerned and that in some ways uh, the world is trying to fill a void that is being left by the multilateral institutions so when you don't have multilateral institutions working uh, it becomes easier for like minded countries to come together form ad hoc coalitions around certain functional areas mm. and that is i think what uh, many countries are trying to do including india in the range of trilaterals that we have uh, Uh, fra- uh, you know um, articulated in recent m- years and i think uh, it's likely that this is going to be the preferred mode of cooperation for some time now given uh, where we find ourselves in the inflection point in global order yeah so structurally the weakness of multilateralism is propelling this uh, trend uh, but harsh going back to the bilateral i mean obviously trilateral builds upon strong bilaterals among all the three players uh, so why not just leave it to bilateral so why should we um, extend it or take it to the next level of bringing in a third player i mean let's take the india france uae for example uh, that's one of the major new initiatives uh, india has taken in terms of trilaterals now already india has got you know strong strategic partnerships with both france and with the uae right so what is the need for bringing all three and pulling all three into one format rather than just sticking to the bilaterals that we have uh, uh, with each other because i think the bilaterals uh, in and of themselves would not give you the kind of leverage that you want in that particular geography or on on fun- on certain functional issue areas so as you as you point out india has ex- excellent relations with uh, uae and with france bilaterally mm. but those are then bilateral distinct relationships if you want a regional impact of your foreign policy then you need to bring these stakeholders together and i think that's what perhaps india has been has done uh, with france and uae in this case and with other pa- partners uh, uh, you know in, in other geographies and other functional areas so i think uh, bilaterals and the way uh, 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 our re- solid bilateral relationship evolves 
takes us logically into the trilateral mode because mm. if you are dissatisfied with the multilateral institutions and you don't have multilateral institutions, for example, at the moment, if you talk of Indo-Pacific, we don't, you know, it's a new There's geography. A large group exactly. Yeah. So mm. how do you manage that, uh, that particular geography? So in that sense, it's easier to build on the bilaterals. If you have strong bilateral relationships with partners, then you can bring them on board and say, let's, you know, let's try out uh, and see whether we can work uh, as a collective on certain areas. So I think that, that perhaps is the logic uh, of taking forward the trilateral engagements and the rapidity with which we have seen these trilaterals grow uh, perhaps tells you that, that uh, many countries find them very successful in the short term right. in bringing to bear their respective capacities. So if you have, for example, India, UAE have certain kinds of capabilities, certain kinds of interactions, and India, France, another kind, then mm. bringing them together perhaps gives you greater leverage in shaping the regional uh, security, e economy, prosperity, and stability. And one can also pool resources and... Uh each country, each player in this trilateral format may bring their own respective comparative advantages to the table, which makes um, more possibilities. Viewers, um, India, France, UAE, we have just been talking about it uh, with Professor Harshpanth. Um, I have a video uh, statement for you from uh, Shrabana Barua, who is at the Indian Council for World Affairs. And uh, I'd like you to hear her view on the India, France, UAE trilateral and the diplomatic energies that we are investing in this and then continue the discussion after hearing from Sharbana Barua. India, France, UAE have been engaging in a trilateral format since last year, for the first time it met in July, for the second time on the sidelines of the 77th UN General Assembly when it was elevated to the ministerial level and for the third time on 4th February recently. There have been many areas of uh, cooperation identified, starting with the Indo-Pacific, where engaging with forums such as IRA have also been kept on the agenda. There is also uh, there are also areas such as energy, where solar and nuclear has found focus. Given that in the past India and, and France have cooperated over the International Solar Alliance, uh, the UAE has led Mangrove Alliance for Climate. These areas of convergences are seen as timely. Therefore. Also timely is the fact that India is leading the G20 presidency as well as that of the SEO this year and the UAE is going to host the COP28. On climate issues, India has also its vision of Panchamrit, making it one of the only countries to have reached or almost reaching its target in the NDCs. Its concept of life has also been endorsed by the other two countries. Therefore, these areas of cooperation are not only seen as convergences but also seen as action oriented. Another area of cooperation has been startup and technological innovation. In fact, a startup 20 engagement group has been introduced under Indian presidency. But it is also to be remembered that India has been engaging with other countries in such formats. The Australia, India, Indonesia is one example. Australia, India, France is another. Therefore, we have to see the trilateral cooperation between India, France and UAE as also proactiveness of Indian diplomacy, its capability in taking multilateral action and growing complexities in the Indo-Pacific. So viewers, you just heard from a researcher at uh, Indian Council for World Affairs about uh, growing complexity in Indo-Pacific and India's proactiveness. And she thinks that that's why the, trying, uh, the trilateral partnerships are happening. Uh, Harsh, um, India, France, UAE, we've already spoken about the convergence, but uh, she was also mentioning the ones that uh, trilateral uh, formats we have entered with Australia. And there is one with France involved in it. Uh, France, Australia, India, it was in trouble for a while because of, non not because of the, these three, but because of extraneous reasons with the U.S., coming in and playing spoil sport on a submarine deal. But uh, Australia is another, uh, you know, major pillar with whom we are doing trilaterals. Australia, France, India, Australia, Indonesia, India. And um, likewise, we have with Japan as well. Um, Japan, um, Australia, India again. There's the so-called J, Japan, America, India. And even Japan, Italy, India. We have uh, formed, a, you know, a dialogue uh, trilateral. So... Uh, and all of these have the Indo-Pacific domain uh, as their basis. And like you said, uh, the more of a strategic element is visible in the way we are forming these groups. And some of these, of course, are intersecting. And some of these also uh, feed into larger grouping like Quad, for example, which are four countries, not just three. Um, but 
uh, all of them seem to have the, the bedrock, which is that we want to be proactive in terms of uh, forming these small clubs or groups uh, with specific purposes. Uh, we heard about you know, all kinds of things ranging from climate change to maritime security to uh, you know, infrastructure. There are many initiatives these kind of trilaterals are engaging in. So what does it all add up to? I mean, when we say they are strategic, uh, we would expect that they are generating some kind of uh, uh, public goods for the region, helping to do the rebalancing that we hope will happen in the Indo-Pacific, and uh, ultimately probably providing some kind of a counterbalance to uh, Chinese uh, hegemony and domination of the region. So your thoughts on all these you know, uh, combinations that we're doing with France, with Australia, with Japan as the uh, other major pillar, but then bringing in other third players into the picture. And perhaps uh, from the point of view of the third players, like let's say Indonesia or Italy, uh, just to take two uh, as an example, maybe it's more comfortable for them to be part of these kind of groupings rather than directly join Quad. Uh, Indonesia, for example, would be hesitant because of fear of backlash from China direct. So maybe trilaterals also give you some degree of comfort and uh, cushioning and protection. Your thoughts on all these things? Uh, yes, I think um, if you if you look at you know, these variable geometries that are emerging uh, in, in 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 the Indo-Pacific in particular, uh, because I think there is a there is a logic to to the emergence, which is as we were discussing that look this is a new strategic geography, all the. Uh, institutions that we have in this geography, they were part of that older framework through which you used to look at this disjuncture between Indian Ocean and Pacific Ocean. Mm. Now that we have brought it together in terms of our strategic mapping, it is very important to have these institutions that can respond to those challenges and there are none at the moment at, the, at that scale, at the multilateral scale. So I think India has been uh, pretty active in shaping uh, the regional, uh, regional strategic architecture by creating these uh, these uh, trilaterals and of course the the quad being the other one and of course quad on two sides uh, of the Indo-Pacific one on uh, the Pacific one in the Middle East but I think uh, India's role uh, in, in terms of bringing like-minded countries together mm. is a very important I would say innovation in uh, in our strategic thinking and in perhaps in also uh, international institutional statecraft because mm. institutions, you know, the, the understanding that, uh, that students of international relations have is that institutions reflect a particular convergence around issue areas and therefore they, are, they become more formal uh, over a period of time, generate their own standard operating procedures, etc. But what we are now witnessing is that a lot of these ad hoc coalitions are emerging. Mm. I, I would say ad hoc because there is, you know, you have these many, as, as, you, as, as you were pointing out, a number of these trilaterals and, and a few quadrilaterals emerging are across this vast uh, uh, geography. Mm. So how do you respond, uh, you know, when you look at the strategic flux in the region, you respond by creating some kind of an institutional architecture. And perhaps this, these are the building blocks of that, eventually what will emerge uh, from this flux. And I think yeah. China's rise is particularly, particularly important uh, because we are trying to respond to it much like other countries are. And because they don't have any other avenue, they are much more, as you point out, much more comfortable in this trilateral setting where you can come together, join hands on certain functional areas you are not defining the remit very broadly. You are saying we are going to work on certain areas, as I think uh, was pointed out in the case of UAE and France. Mm. We are saying we will work on energy, we will work on climate change, we are work on sustainability. But of course, there is a there is a uh, there is a comfort because all three countries uh, strategically look as Western Indian Ocean as their primary geographic domain. Mm. So they are comfortable in operating in that space. So therefore, that brings them together to work on broader uh, sort of more. Uh, environmental sustainable development uh, related issues similarly when you talk of japan and australia i mean bilaterally uh, india is perhaps most comfortable at the moment with japan and australia in the wider indo pacific mm. now how do you uh, you know enhance the ability of these bilaterals to shape the strategic logic in the indo pacific you do that by bringing in more countries yeah. now the easiest way to do more uh, to do that is by trilateral partnerships which as you point out in almost all of them either japan or, or australia is the is our preferred partner and then we are bringing in other partners uh, to add uh, value to, to, to that relationship. So I think a number of very interesting innovations are happening. Uh, and and but I, would, I would look at it as, as perhaps India and, and some other nations' response to this institutional void that exists in the Indo-Pacific. Mm. What do you do if, you, if your multilateral frameworks are not working or are, or are not up to the challenge of 21st century uh, problems? And so we are filling the vacuum in a way. Um, Hatsha, also, is it um, observable that Leave aside the JAI, which in, in any way has been subsumed by the Quad now, Japan, America, India. But otherwise, 
almost all the participants in these trilaterals are middle to rising middle powers. So there's something peculiar about middle powers, isn't it, where we have strength in numbers and we have to come together and coordinate uh, because uh, multilateral or plurilateral or minilateral uh, is the way for middle powers to exert influence, isn't it? And uh, it looks like a lot of these are middle power coalitions or clubs. And uh, uh, is that also, you think, um, you know, something to do with the international system because we are aspiring, India is aspiring to become a great power or leading power as we call it. We have, you know, on the way, but miles to go. So in the meantime, uh, if we have to shore up the region and if we have to uh, maintain sea lanes of communication and, uh, you know, rules-based order and all these. Perhaps there's no uh, alternative for middle powers than to come in the, into these small groupings. Yeah, I think that has been one of the most fascinating developments in the last uh, few years, that uh, middle powers shouldering greater responsibility uh, for, provide, for the provision of uh, public goods. And I think uh, partly I see this as a response to the structural dynamic of China's rise, but, but partly it is also the fact that I think many of these countries are uncomfortable with where or unsure of where America is going. Mm. So, you know, a lot of, you know, Japan and Australia have long relied on, on their alliance with the U.S. and they still do. But I think there is there is some sense of vulnerability that they fear. And so they want an endogenous exactly. within the region. Yeah, It seems that, and that's why you see, you know, um, uh, Japan under Abe was one of the most proactive proponents of, of, of you know, uh, middle powers working together. He pushed India much more uh, into, into Indo-Pacific and thinking more creatively about it. And India responded. Uh, similarly, you have Australia now, uh, you know, post its disjuncture with, with China, looking at Indo-Pacific uh, in, in a much greater detail and its partnership with India with a greater strategic focus. And so I think middle powers now looking at Indo-Pacific, uh, resident powers there looking at this region as their primary area, and also thinking about how do you manage the challenges in the absence of America's commitment, uh, which may not be total, yeah. uh, because America either is distracted or the domestic politics within America is such that you really cannot rely on the transitions happening there. So how do you ensure that you are on a, on a, on a you know, surer footing? And one of the best ways to do it is to find uh, middle powers with whom you are like-minded and converge on, on certain areas. And that's what perhaps we are witnessing at the moment. Yeah. And Harsh, one of the things uh, you notice also with the trilaterals, uh, India is also doing some very unorthodox ones uh, in the military domain, defense. For example, there is the uh, SITMEX, they call it Singapore, India, Thailand all three of them uh, forming a kind of a defense trilateral and doing uh, joint uh, naval exercises and all that. And uh, so it suggests that also um, if there is no way for us, for the quad to be expanded or for more people to come in, but we'll find other means through which to keep these countries engaged and uh, involved in, uh, you know, security for the region. So specifically on the defense side, you know, uh, People know there are all the other things we're doing on the civilian side, you know, infrastructure and uh, uh, climate change and energy and those sort of... But on the defense side, uh, how do you think trilaterals will go? I mean, we also have the Malabar, which is four countries, uh, which is essentially the defense uh, counterpart to Quad. But then there are also other formations we're doing uh, and trying to bring in more players. It looks like our diplomacy, our strategy is to bring in more players. And the Europeans have also come in, and this is making it more interesting, this region. The one with Japan and Italy is interesting. Because Japan and Italy are now ramping up their own bilateral defense uh, co-production and joint ventures. And they find India, you know, useful. And the Italians are saying that they will bring in their uh, prowess uh, with regard to Operation Atalanta, which they had done uh, to counter uh, piracy in the Western Indian Ocean. And uh, likewise, you know, so... Um, there is this, um, you know, defense side. And how do you think, how far can this go? And do you think this is enough joint exercises or we should be doing more through these trilaterals? Uh, I think on the defense side, we are still, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, maturing in some ways. We are still trying to assess how far we can go with some of these partnerships. But it is very important because uh, I think one of the biggest issues in the region is perhaps... Uh, uh, you know, how do you make provision for uh, for regional security in, in mm. a collective manner? And, uh, and if you see the kind of challenges that China is posing everywhere, and if you see the, the enormous imbalance in the region, um, uh, defense imbalance, given where China is qualitatively, quantitatively, uh, 
countries that want to protect their sovereignty, countries that want to protect their autonomy, strategic autonomy, will have to do much more on defense because at, at the end of the day, India as an emerging power will have to give that sense to smaller countries in the region, to, to smaller partners in the region, that it is there you know, of course, as, a, as an economic partner, but also as a security guarantor of some kind. Yeah. You know, we may not be able to do everything on our own. Therefore, we need partners that can work together. And India has, I think, Indian Navy has been very, very proactive from, from for a very long time, for almost two decades now, in reaching out to uh, you know literal countries in the in the Indian Ocean and in in, in fact in the in the ASEAN groups that you talked about. Yeah. A lot yeah. of the countries do regular exercises with us, and I think that has evolved to a point where you can expand into trilateral engagement or even mm. bigger engagements of that kind, which I think gradually we are moving in that direction. So I think defense is going to become an increasingly important component of the trilateral arrangements that we find ourselves uh, you know, pushing. But it will be al uh, almost inevitable that, that that happens because of the security landscape and how that is changing, particularly in light of what, what may happen or what, what happened last year in Taiwan and how you know, such, such, suddenly the instrumentality of force is becoming such a visible issue in global politics. Absolutely. Unilateral exercise of power is a major threat perceived by many of these uh, middle and rising powers and that's why they're coming together in trilaterals and other formats. Uh, viewers, so they, we also have traditional uh, trilateral cooperation uh, initiatives with the countries uh, that are not necessarily only geostrategic and uh, these cover a variety of issue areas and on this uh, I'd like you to hear uh, India's External Affairs Minister Dr. Subramaniam Jayashankar talking about how India forms a variety of partnerships based on the issues. Uh, let's hear him and then come back. The statecraft uh, uh, here is really how do, you, how do you manage contradictions? You know, how do you have different agendas, different partners, uh, different uh, uh, abilities to, to deal with them? And that is actually the challenge for diplomacy. Now, it is also a particular challenge for bigger countries because bigger countries have more varied interests. So when you have more varied interests, you have different kinds of partners. Now, if you look today uh, at you know, who are our partners, our political partners, our security partners, our developmental partners, our energy partners, our digital partners would all be different combinations of people. So it's not just how do you deal with two sets of people. Depending on the issue, you will get a different combination of countries to deal with. So viewers, uh, you just heard this um, um, from uh, our external affairs minister saying that we deal with different combinations of countries depending on the issues. Uh, uh, Harsh, um, there is the older South-South cooperation-based uh, you know, trilateral formats which have existed for a few decades now. For example, we have the India-Brazil-South Africa, uh, IBSA. Uh, we have the RIC, Russia, India, China. Now, these trilaterals uh, predate the Indo-Pacific ones that we have just spoken. And in many ways, they were formed in maybe the Halcyon era of the, uh, you know, South-South cooperation uh, when China was seen also as a, you know, a middle power and we all had something in common. We wanted to uh, make the world better and, you know, revise the international order in a fair and just way. And of course, some of those concerns remain. We still, on climate change, on trade and such things, we have a lot in common with uh, fellow developing countries. So if you look at those older ones, IPSA, RIC, those kind of trilateral, I mean, we still have ministerial uh, meetings and so on, although we haven't had summits in, on this format uh, lately. So how would you rate these in the current era, I mean, where there's more geopolitical competition? Uh, would you say that these have lost their relevance, RIC and IPSA, and we should just forget them and just, you know, focus on the ones which have more strategic content? Or do you think that those will persist and those have their own uh, momentum that will have to continue, given that we have these, what Dr. Jayshankar calls, varied interests on a range of topics as we become a bigger power? See, I think... Uh you know, institutions of any kind, uh, they don't disappear that easily. So they'll persist, I'm, uh, I, you know, in, in some way. But the issue I, that, that, I, that I find uh, is interesting and important is that the present ones, the newer ones that, that we have been talking about uh, over the last uh, few minutes, they have a strategic logic which is very sharp and very visible. Mm. The older ones, like IPSA or RIC, had some 
broader logic as you were mentioning, you know, the argument that look, uh, we are all developing countries, we all need to work towards multilateral reforms. M all of those issues are very much alive, but I think the context has changed. So mm. where China used to be a partner in terms of asking for multilateral reforms in a way that does not destabilize the entire system, today China has a very different agenda. Similarly, when you look at, uh, you know, Russia, for example, it's, a, it's, it's still a bilateral partner for India. But on certain issues like territorial sovereignty and integrity, there are questions around whether we will be a partner in, in that context. So th mm. th the issues remain uh, uh, which these uh, platforms had highlighted. But I think that go going forward, uh, particularly with respect to China, it's very difficult to see how, uh, given our present state of bilateral relationships, uh, we can move forward because uh, the newer ones, as we were discussing, have a very strong bilateral component that when you are bilaterally mm. comfortable with each other strategically, you can then develop those trilaterals in a much more robust manner. Here the problem is particularly with RIC is China and how our bilateral relationship with China is, uh, is almost at a very edge standstill. So what is the future? IPSA, I think, still is uh, perhaps a very important one for mm -hmm. India, mm -hmm. given that both Brazil and South Africa in different geographies uh, as, as uh, uh, fellow democracies are very important part of a very bigger conversation, of a larger conversation that we want to have uh, with the developing countries. And of course, India that wants to project its vo the voice of the global south th through G20 would find that Brazil and South Africa will be very important partners in that journey yeah. uh, because they have very similar developmental uh, strategic agendas broadly. But I think on RIC, you would, you would find that you'll have to uh, think more creatively as to what is the future here. Um, of course, it then also moved into BRICS, which yeah. is a much uh, you know, a bigger yeah. platform. Yeah, I mean, sometimes RIC helps uh, to moderate the Chinese, I suppose, through the Russian you know, intermediation and such things. But uh, overall, uh, viewers, you just heard from Professor Harshpant about these two different types of trilaterals. And what he's saying is that if there's more competition internally within the trilateral, then they probably will not have the same kind of, uh, you know, uh, strength to be able to achieve the shared objectives. Uh, but uh, overall, the point is trilaterals uh, seem to be the uh, trend uh, in diplomacy, in Indian diplomacy, and also for many other countries. I want to thank Professor Harshpant for sharing very valuable insights on this uh, emerging trend. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. So that's all. Um, uh, this time, viewers, uh, do think about trilaterals, trilateral cooperation, trilateral partnerships uh, are emerging as important uh, uh, combinations through which uh, India is trying to uh, advance its national interests and also uh, bring together like-minded countries to uh, remake regional and international orders. Uh, I'll see you again next time. Until then, take care.